Hey guys. Um, like she said, my name is Matt. I'm a cartoonist. Um, since I'm the keynote, I am exempt from the rules. And because I am exempt from the rules, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to blow your minds figuratively, literally, chemically, and spiritually right out your butts. <laughs> I do not believe in Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. I don't believe in Lamarckian evolution. <laughs> I do not believe in primordial soup. <laughs> and as for Pam Spermia, it's a bunch of bull honky. I believe that all things on this earth were created by God. And I don't mean Jesus. And I don't mean Buddha. And I don't mean Allah. And I don't mean some general God that we can all rally around and believe in. <laughs> I mean my God. From my town and my church. My God is a fire breathing lobster <laughs> who lives behind the rings of Saturn. And his name is Gibbers Krabst. I'm from a small town of Bumshart in Eberhoma. And in Bumshart, we know and we believe in our hearts that America is God's favorite country. And this led me to a realization that lobsters, as they grow older, continue to get bigger. They molt and molt and molt and they grow in size. This led to a meme on the internet a few years ago that they're immortal. It's not actually true. They just keep getting bigger. And Gibbers is a lobster. And we live in this great country of the United States of America. And what I realized about the American culture and the American people is that we're not getting stronger or faster or better. We're just getting bigger. <laughs> and I believe that if you eat enough and you treat your face like a garbage disposal, one day you will get to go to the heavens with gibbers. <laughs> Furthermore, I did some studies, and I ran across this wonderful organism known as a bombardier beetle. He is a beauty, or she. He's very cute. What's remarkable about the bombardier beetle is in his anus, he has a Gatling gun. It's a dual-chambered gun that combines two chemicals, and then uh, an igniter fluid is propelled into it, and it can be, act as an offensive or defensive weapon. Fires, typically 70 rounds, 500 rounds per shot at uh, produces a caustic acid that's over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And I look at this, and I think, God made that butthole. <laughs> that's not the work of science. I believe bombardier beetles are direct descendants of gibbers, our lord and savior. They're both arthropods, and they both have weaponized orifices. Furthermore, this is a photo of Saturn's rings taken from uh, the European Space Agency. It's an older photo. And if you notice the coloration, and a lot of people believe that Saturn's rings are composed of ice and dust. Um, my belief is that bombardier beetles are the chosen ones, and trillions of them descend upon Saturn in the afterlife and fire stuff out of their butts going in circles. Which, if you look closely, look at the colors. It's undeniable. Charles Darwin, in 1823, prior to his voyage on the HMS Beagle with Captain Robert Fitzroy, was on a bug hunt. And he was still in Britain at the time, and Charles Darwin loved insects. And on this bug hunt, he was walking through the woods, and he came upon a tree and started peeling the bark off. And he saw a beetle that he'd never seen before, and he thought, this beetle was amazing. This is crazy. Gotta have this beetle. So he picked it up in his left hand. Kept peeling bark with his right hand. Another beetle emerged. He thought, that one's even better than the first one. I need that beetle grabbed the second beetle. At that moment, the most gorgeous beetle he's ever seen emerged from the tree. So Charles Darwin took the beetle in his left hand, popped it in his mouth, picked up the third beetle. The beetle Charles Darwin put in his mouth was a bombardier beetle. <laughs> and as you can imagine, it got angry, fired caustic acid out of its butthole into Darwin's mouth, and he lost all three beetles. Now, you could just think of this as an anecdote and not actual data, but I believe, I believe this event in history was was gibbers intervening and saying, hey bro, 
You're leading these people astray. <laughs> Next, I want to talk about the Brazilian wandering spider. It's a large spider. It's endemic to Brazil. They're called banana spiders because they hang out in banana trees. Uh, typically, when you hear about them, it's because they've imported bananas in the country, and there's a, a spider that comes out of it. Um, they, uh, most spiders are innocuous. They build webs, they stay in those webs, and they, if, you, if you see them in your home, they'll actually eat things that will harm you, ticks, mosquitoes, uh, bees, things along those lines. I call them mall cops. I let them run amok in my house. I'm like, spiders, be free. Not the banana spider. The banana spider does not build webs. It chases things and eats them and kills them. They call them horse killers in Brazil because they can take down a horse. Their venom is just as venomous as a black widow. The difference is, drop for drop, they deliver 10 times as much venom in one bite as a black widow. Highly, highly venomous. Furthermore, they're very, very aggressive. Uh, I met an entomologist, and he was telling a story about he was in Brazil, and he encountered one of these things. And he's a bug guy, so he's fearless, picks up bugs, you know what I mean, he's one of those guys. When he saw the Brazilian wandering spider, he got a broom and was like, get the fuck away, and did one of those kinds of things. Banana spider <laughs> ran up the broom handle. So, incredibly aggressive, incredibly venomous. There are stories of Brazilian villages that have at night these banana spiders drop in the trees and run into the villages looking for children and men and women to terrorize. Um, final kicker with the Brazilian wandering spider is if you are bitten and you don't have access to the antivenom, you get a fever, diarrhea, vomiting, eventually paralysis, asphyxiation, and death. Hours and hours of lonely, <laughs> agonizing death. And if you are a man and you're bitten and you don't have access to the antivenom, antivenom you suffer what's called priapism. Now, priapism is a persistent erection until you are dead. <laughs> so, to, uh, you should not applaud that. <laughs> to put this in perspective, uh, this is a very aggressive spider that, uh, when provoked, they don't run away and scurry into a crevice. What they do is they stand up on their back legs and they rear up and they expose their palps on the underside of their body. Their palps look like a vagina. They look like a vagina and not a good one. It's orange. <laughs> so I want to summarize the banana spider. This is an eight-legged vagina <laughs> that gives you boners until you are dead. This is not the work of natural selection. Nothing this horrible could be created by nature. This is the work of a god. <laughs> With a bombardier beetle, I say, God created that butthole. With a banana spider, God created that vagina. <laughs> now, as a member of the esteemed scientific community, of which I am not, I know, I know the importance of finding proof and citing your sources and giving you actual empirical, statistical, physical, spiritual evidence of what I am saying. So, I decided to do some science. So, I got my telescope, got my microscope, got my oscilloscope, my stethoscope, I got some scope, and I did. A solid 45 minutes of science on this, and I came to a conclusion. There was absolutely zero evidence of a giant fire-breathing lobster living amongst the stars. None whatsoever. Zero. I discovered that trying to scientifically prove God is a lot like trying to find your car keys using Microsoft Bing. <laughs> this led to a crisis. A crisis of faith. Until I had an epiphany. A friend of mine held up all the fingers on his right hand. He said, how many fingers am I holding up? I looked. I said, you're holding up three. He says, no, I'm holding up five. One, two, three, four, five. I said, no, it's three. He says, how, how can you believe there's three when I'm showing you five right now? That's the power of faith. <laughs> it lets you believe the dumbest shit imaginable despite the evidence staring you in the face with giant fucking eyeballs. That's faith, and that's what I'm going to operate on for the rest of my life. Because I know some things. I know that I'm a hairy bag of meat sitting on a rock, hurtling through a vacuum of space at 67,000 miles an hour around an exploding ball of fire. I know that someday that ball of fire 
will explode. And that pale blue dot of ours will burn. And everything and everyone I've ever loved will be fucking barbecue. <laughs> I know these things. I know that someday I'm going to die. I know that I am completely powerless in the wake of this beautiful, beautiful cosmic shitstorm we call existence. And when I look up at the night sky, I don't feel, I don't feel whole. I don't feel connected. I feel alone. That's where faith comes in. That's where gibbers comes in. Here's my spiritual duct tape. My dog made a crazy glue. He is the servant of the soul. And I want you to know that every time you point your telescope into the sky, or you point your microscope into your own body, gibbers. I want you to know, and I need you to know, gibbers, die for your science. Thank you very much.